Hello! Today's stories come from r slash malicious compliance. We have four stories today of top quality malicious compliance. Our first story, despite being short, is an extra large size helping. It's called, My HOA Will Learn That I Absolutely Live By The Letter Of The Law. My HOA recently changed the rules limiting the amount of vehicles allowed in my driveway. I collect cars, all of which run, drive, and are registered and insured. And my household also has four licensed drivers. When I moved in, the rules stated only one Class C vehicle allowed per driveway. Well, that was fine by me, since Class C vehicles don't exist. Class C vehicles were not defined in the HOA rules either. I assume whoever wrote that rule assumes since they had a Class C license, standard cars and trucks must be Class C. So I moved in, and after stuffing two cars, four motorcycles, and my camper in my garage, I placed five vehicles in my driveway. The letters came. I was quickly able to deflate them after asking them for the legal definition of a Class C vehicle. No fines paid. Fast forward about a year and the HOA proposed a rule change. Now stating, three vehicles per driveway maximum. Since three is more than one and people lack critical thinking skills, it was passed with over 85% support. Fine. Three vehicles it is. I did some digging and found the streets in my HOA were turned over to the city. An effort to avoid having to foot the maintenance bill, I'm sure. And as such, the HOA had no authority to stop people from parking on a public street. So I moved two vehicles to the very narrow street, one in front of my house and one directly across the street in front of my neighbor's house. Now, the only vehicles that could safely drive past my home were motorcycles and the one guy with the smart car. It was glorious. My street is a main artery into and out of the neighborhood. Lots of U-turns and backtracking for folks to get home or to work. They are the ones who did the rest of the work for me. Complaints and calls to the HOA president resulted in another rule change vote. Now my driveway is open to any amount of legally registered vehicles. It fits nine. I need more cars. Well done, OP. Way to work the system to get your desired outcome. Let's head to the comments where, unsurprisingly, one gets the sense that parking is not exactly an uncommon HOA issue. Sagacious Elan said, I'm kind of surprised that last part worked. You can certainly park on a public street, but not usually in such a way that you block said street. OP replied, City would have had to have the planning commission place signs along one side of the road designating it a no parking zone. Cars were parked legally within six inches of the curbs. Since we all know how slow government is to respond to anything, I hedge my bets. In response to hedging my bets, Ektish said, keep them tidy to avoid HOA fines. ZSK added, if there's one thing you can rely on, it's the inefficiency of bureaucracy. Wingen in Vegas shared, had a similar issue with my HOA. They decided that I couldn't park my truck with a trailer on the street in front of my house. Sent me a fine notice. I responded that I was parked legally and they couldn't regulate city streets. They stated that there was a state law that let HOAs manage streets in their community, but they skipped over the part that it only applied to gated communities where they did the maintenance. Got a letter from the director of parking for the city, stating that only the city could regulate parking and that a truck and trailer was legal for 72 hours and then had to be moved, but there was no distance rules on how far it had to be moved. They shut up quickly. Someone added, huh, no distance rules means turn on, Move one to two parking spots or opposite side and you're okay. Lufa of Doom shared, My HOA has a rule that you can only have eight pet legs in your home. So, two normal cats or two normal dogs. Or two three-legged quadrupeds plus one bird. One quadruped plus two birds. Eight one-legged birds. How many snacks? Ha <laughs> ha. Tesseract said, or one tarantula. Also, any HOA who wants to tell me how many cats I can keep in my home can get fracked. Ooh, this next story was so good. Made only better by OP, but let's not spoil it before we start. It reads, want me to unload my own trailer? Okay, I needed a vacation anyway. So I was a trucker for a while, and that comes with plenty of stories of crazy things in so many places. One of my favorite stories, however, comes from a piece of malicious compliance that came together just perfectly. The setup. I tend to be a bit on the lazy side when I can get away with it, and I searched for quite some time to find a company that would keep me far away from unloading the trailers myself. 
I found a good one that had a 95% drop and hook rate, drop off a trailer full of goods, then grab a new one that's either loaded or to take to the next pickup. 4.9% of them are either handled by the receiving dock or by lumpers, dock workers hired by warehouse companies specifically to unload trucks. That 0.1% is a list of places that just want to watch you work or be convinced that you really shouldn't operate their lifts. In my contract, I saw that there was a place where your hourly rate for unloading was stated. Not for the hours that you were sitting and waiting to be unloaded, but for when you were the one unloading your own trailer. I also saw that the contract allowed for alterations to be made to the price of this service to be charged to the customer. As a joke, I put in not one, but two extra zeros. $1,500 an hour for unloading a trailer? Should deter most people. Most people saw that, got a good laugh, then pulled in someone to unload for me. The event. Most people, like I said, were smart. This run was set to arrive at 0300 to a certain clothing store in the mall. Let's call them I.B. Nickeled. I'd been to the store a few times before and it was always the same manager, Mr. Dime, receiving me, and it was always the same runaround. If I wanted to get unloaded, I had to wait for someone to get there. Then I'd have to sit and wait while the poor kid back there got the load off. Then I'd have to wait for traffic to ease up to get out since it was always almost 10.30 by the time I finally left leaving me with only a couple of hours left on my clock to get to a truck stop for the day. I got there, and yep, Mr. Dime had come in to accept the load. It was always hard to be smart at 0300, and I can only imagine that was part of Mr. Dime's usual runaround. This time was a bit different for a few reasons. One, he smelled like there was a bit of an herbal calming remedy about him to settle his nerves for the night. Two, he said that he was completely understaffed and there was no one around to unload me so I'd have to do it myself. Three, I couldn't stay to my usual time because he had to leave before 0500. To be fair to him, I did try and say, sure, but my contract says, I don't give a hoot what your contract states. I don't have anyone in until the store opens, and I've got an appointment that's more important than some trucker's contract. Just unload it yourself. I considered it for a moment and went back up to my truck to get my tablet. This was in 2019 before the virus and the company had just swapped over to tablets for certain things, like signing off an expense or getting permissions. Mr. Dime was fuming when I came back and handed him the tablet. Just read through and sign with your finger. He didn't read through. I had 20 pallets at one and a half thousand pounds each. The only available tool to unload was a manual pallet jack. I started my work clock and began unloading at 0315. At 0500, Mr. Dime looks on in satisfaction to see me about three quarters of the way through as he's out the door. At 0515, Mr. Dime's replacement, Mr. Quarter of the day shift, comes running in with his face white as a sheet to see me taking off the fourth to last pallet. Please tell me that I'm reading this wrong, he pled fruitlessly. I wish I could, I lied, knowing that Mr. Dime was about to be up a muddy creek with a spoon. I even tried telling Mr. Dime what he was getting into, but he just skimmed and signed. He slumped. Wait here, I need to call my district manager. Better be quick. I want to be out of this lot by 0630 to beat the morning rush and get a good breakfast. He ran back and I continued unloading. When I finally got the last pallet off at 0550, I turned off my time clock as the district manager came in. We'll call him Mr. Dollar, just to keep consistent followed both by Mr. Corder, who was looking somewhat relieved, and by Mr. Dime, who was somewhere between terrified and furious. You're Mr. Arrow? Mr. Dollar asked, holding a printout and looking to it for the name. That's me, I agreed. I take it they sent over the contract Mr. Dime signed. Yes, and that's just it. Mr. Dime is accusing you of forging his signature on this since there's no way he'd sign off on a multi-thousand dollar contract just to unload a trailer especially since he claims you insisted on unloading it yourself. I whistled. <whistles> That's a heck of an accusation. Hey, is that CCTV I see up in that corner over there? I asked, knowing full well that the entire loading dock was covered by a slew of cameras. The one I pointed out was positioned just right to catch the whole conversation at the door. Mr. Corder, get the footage, Mr. Dollar said. We don't have audio, but we do have visual on them. Mr. Dime lost his Fury, and now just looked petrified. The fallout. One review later, and I was grinning like a loon back to my truck. I called my manager, booked some home time, and walked away with enough money to last to the end of the month. The next time I went into that, I be nickeled. There was a new, much
much more sensible manager who always had a man on staff to unload the trucks. Edits, and to clarify a few things. 1. Yes, I milked it a bit, though not as much as some people might think. Like I said, I was regularly there from 0300 to 1030 at the latest. Throw on top of that the fact that I've never been the healthiest of individuals, and it took me that long to keep from hurting myself. This was during the summer in SoCal, and even at night it was still approximately 90 degrees Fahrenheit outside, hotter in the trailer without any air conditioning. A fat man with no AC is going to take all the time he wants. 2. Why didn't Mr. Dime do any of this himself, and why did he lie? Truckers tend to get the short end of the stick, even when we're regulars to a place. This was the fifth or sixth time I'd been there spread out over the course of four months or so, so I was familiar enough that I was recognized at the dock, but not so much that they really cared to keep track of it. The manager figured he could probably get away with shafting me since he claimed I didn't like how long I was waiting. I feel like he's made other truckers get to that point, but none of them had hourly rates like mine on their contract. He's just one of many that thought he could get away with blaming it on that dirty trucker when it went wrong for him. 3. What happened while we watched the video was pretty anticlimactic. The recording was on Mr. Corder's phone when he came back and was pretty low quality, but you could still make out that I argued with him about unloading for a minute before coming back, and he did indeed sign it. Mr. Dollar said, You can go, Arrow. Mr. Dime, go wait in the office now. I got going while the going was good. This is amazing. Really highlights that you should always read through things thoroughly before signing anything. I love that OP put down $1,500 per hour for unloading as a joke and then ended up getting that rate. Let's check out some comments calling out Mr. Dime for his real mistake. Someone said, If you frack something up, it can be fixed most times and can be used as a learning experience. You lie about fracking up? Well, now that's a whole new issue in itself. Forget whatever it was that was messed up. Had a technician at my current job essentially cause $8,000 in direct costs and costed the customer upwards of 70 k He was brought to a meeting with managers, etc. The problem was found and a procedure made for it. Had another guy lie about having done an oil change and brakes during a general service, and he was let go. It's like parents always say, tell me and I'll be upset. Lie to me and I'll be angry. Scratch said, I'd have refused to lump for $15 an hour too. I'm not a trucker, but I know plenty. $15 per hour is insulting considering what the average hourly for in-scope work, let alone doing something much more physical and demanding than the in-scope work. I'm a firm believer that out-of-scope work that has a specific fee needs to be set at a rate that discourages the behavior, not encourage it. Since $15 per hour is minimum wage, and you're much more valuable doing your actual job, I have a background as a heavy-duty mechanic, but now do piecework technical install. When we're sitting on site with our thumb up our rear and can't do our job, we're losing money. So the company charges accordingly. $100 per hour charge for standby to the client at the standard labor rate division, roughly 50-50 split between me and the company. Glass Half Smash said, And this, kids, is why you don't double down on your error when you make a mistake. Genuine mistakes can be explained away with maybe a warning. Outright lying on top of the mistake easily escalates it to gross negligence and is easily a fireable offense. Good malicious compliance with extra petrol needlessly poured on top. Steam Spectrometer said, I love the, that's a heck of an accusation. Hey, is that CCTV I see up in that corner over there? Our third story is short, but out of this world. It's called, well, he did say no matter what it was. I worked as a dispatcher for a small town police department out west. There was always a bit of a struggle with our patrol sergeant who looked down his nose at dispatch, always trying to micromanage our department and bully our dispatch sergeant. One day, he discovered that dispatchers were handling small routine matters such as answering questions from the public and handling other minor issues that didn't require a police response. He was outraged. He stomped around the station for a bit, then issued a memo. It began with a condescending essay about how dispatchers were not qualified to answer questions or handle minor issues, as only fully trained police officers were capable of such weighty matters. He then issued a directive that an officer would be sent on any call received from the public, no matter what it was. Our dispatch sergeant just smiled and told us to follow the directive, that she was sure it wouldn't last long. As luck would have it, I was on duty that very night, and I guess I was living right as the call came in. Then another, and another. 
a rather bright meteor had gone harmlessly over the town at a fairly low altitude. Pretty spectacular, really, but obvious as to what it was. My phone rang off the hook, most just wanting to ask if anyone thought it had fallen to earth near the town. Not really an issue for the town police, but, well, he did say no matter what it was. The radio traffic went along these lines. Unit 28, stand by for traffic. 28. 28, this will be an attempt to locate, advise when ready to copy. 28, go. Be advised, this will be a greenish glowing object last seen at an estimated altitude of 3,500 feet, traveling in a northwesterly direction at approximately 1,500 miles per hour. If located, stop and identify occupants. 10-9? Patrol sergeant shouting into Mike from his radio at home. Did you get a call on this? Affirmative, this station has received multiple calls and per your directive, an officer has been dispatched. Sound of a radio being slammed to a desk. The next morning, the issue was compounded a bit as the responding officer also followed his directive and filed an official report, noting that the object had fled our jurisdiction before contact could be made and recommended the matter be referred to the FBI for further investigation, as he had reason to believe the object had crossed state lines. Our captain and chief were laughing to tears, and our detective volunteered to go assist the FBI investigation, theorizing it had gone to Vegas. A new memo was issued by the captain, stating that dispatchers were to have full discretion in the handling of calls and minor matters for the public. Love it. How demoralizing would it have been as a trained dispatcher to be told you don't have the logic or common sense to be able to assess incoming calls? My goodness. Well, it really bit the patrol sergeant in the butt. Let's head to the comments for a small update from OP. In response to the object had fled our jurisdictions, Waylorn said, Gold star, officer. Crin said, suspected that it fled to Vegas, willing to assist FBI by traveling there. Dude is genius. Kirby Dingo said, I'm guessing that the patrol sergeant was universally disliked. OP replied, yes. He ended up being pushed out of the department eventually. Nothing overt, but I guess he finally learned you're only as good a boss as the people under you let you be. Codfish Joe added, It's an important leadership principle. If you take care of your workers, they'll take care of you. And if you don't take care of your workers, they'll definitely take care of you. Our last story is another short one, but something everyone will have done once and will have you cheering OP on. The story is, don't like it? Leave. This happened today. My husband and I have been car shopping as I was in an auto accident at the beginning of summer. Our car was totaled in the accident and it has been a long process. We finally decided on the automobile we wanted, got all our paperwork completed and had our financing all worked out. All we needed to do was sign all the paperwork and drive away. The dealership is 90 minutes from our house, so we took the kids out of school early and my husband took off work after lunch. We wanted to make sure we were home in time to keep our typical school night schedule going. We get to the dealership at our agreed upon time. We did one more test drive and were ready to sign everything. Then the game started. All of a sudden, the finance office wasn't ready for us. Then, after an almost two hour wait, they were ready. The finance person started by trying to upsell us on all the add ons dealers try to sell you. We told her we didn't want anything extra. We just wanted to look at the numbers, read the paperwork, sign it all, and head out. Due to our wait, we had a limited amount of time to get this done and still be able to get home in time for the kids' bedtime routine. The first thing she does is pull out a different set of numbers than we were originally given and agreed to. All of a sudden, there is a dealership fee for selling us a car at this time of year. Nearly 1K for this nonsense. Then she states that if we don't like the fee, we could leave, as they have people begging to buy cars from them. So, my husband and I stood to leave. She then tells us we can't leave as she has already printed the forms. I laughed at her and told her to go out and get one of those beggars to buy it. So far, the finance person has called twice and the salesperson has called four times. I guess they weren't expecting someone to get that far and then walk away. And this is why car dealerships have such a crappy reputation. This is so typical. Special fees my butt. I once had an interaction where the person filing the paperwork was new and totally reasonable. And when I challenged a fee, someone more senior came in to help her out, told her she didn't know what she was doing because she was new. So I escalated to the GM and didn't pay any of those BS fees. I felt really bad for her and was kind of embarrassed that someone more senior questioned her capabilities. Anyway, 
There's more insight in the comments explaining the corporate strategy behind this infernal practice. Let's check it out. Pleasant Desert shared, Love this. Happened to me too. Walked out right before ink hit paper. GM called me to apologize for the finance person's behavior. Too bad, so sad. In response to GM called me to apologize, Gemini said, So what new and better deal for me did you call to offer as an apology? Pleasant Desert replied, Good point. He didn't present a better offer. Just a mea culpa. I was too disgusted with how their dealership handled everything, so I just told him you need my money more than I need your car, and to please speak with their employees so they don't lose or upset future customers. And Theric said, Sorry, you called us on our bluff. Works for the other 9 out of 10 customers, though, so they'll keep doing it. Otto von Yismark said, Exactly. It's called controlled customer dissatisfaction. This is why you always see just the perfect number of people in line at the grocery store that you decide to wait it out instead of abandoning your cart. Just as the average line length starts to fall, they close a register. There is some bean counter in the corporate office for the dealership to find the perfect balance between one, squeezing the maximum number of dollars out of their customers by using upselling bait and switch and high pressure sales tactics, and two, running off all their customers for using upselling bait and switch and high pressure sales tactics. GM called the user because they were one of the few that say, frack you, this is unacceptable, and walked out. Someone said, I bet the look on their face was priceless. OP replied, it was amazing. Apple Knight 88 said, a friend of mine used to sell cars and he told me they don't get serious until you threaten to leave. He stood up and began to leave every time he bought a car. I helped my mother-in-law buy a used car and started by telling the salesman we had limited time. So rather than him going back and forth to the sales manager, I made an offer. Take it or leave it. He returned with the sales manager. I held my ground and we left with the car. If you've enjoyed the story and would like to hear more, consider liking, subscribing, and leaving a comment. Thanks and bye for now.